Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started. I'm sure folks will continue to trickle in. Thank you to Patrick for um, handling the waiting room and, and all the logistics for us. Um, so I'm Kavi Landsberg. My pronouns are he, him. Um, and I am the staff attorney for our pre-filing initiative, which we're going to talk about today. Good morning, everyone. My name is Ebony Porter. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I am the parent support case manager with our pre-filing unit. Um, yeah, thank you for being here. And just one bit of housekeeping. Um, so we are very much envisioning this as a conversation. So as questions come up, please feel free to just put them in the chat. We've saved some time at the end for Q&A, so we'll probably address them then, um, but we're hoping to save a good amount of time. So please do put questions in the chat as they arise. So the program that Ebony and I developed um, took shape at the Children's Law Center of California, where we work, um, which is the largest children's services organization in the country providing direct representation for over 33,000 youth in the foster care system in Los Angeles, Sacramento, and Placer counties. And as you can see, that representation is provided by specialty interdisciplinary teams consisting of social workers, lawyers, case managers, and the like, all working in tandem together. And so our pre-filing um, initiative came about, um, it was actually the vision of our former director, Lucia Murillo, who was just appointed and is now a judge doing big things. But she really wanted to focus um, this project on our parenting, um, pregnant and parenting clients um, with the goal of supporting the most at-risk clients, um, just to ensure that um, them and their young children do not experience child welfare intervention or become dependents themselves. And so we really, really um, wanted to focus our goal on breaking the intergenerational cycle of foster care. And we can talk a little bit more about like what that looks like and how we've worked to do that. Um, so our clients are all either parenting or pregnant. Um, we service minor um, parents um, as well as non-minor dependents, um, 18 to 21 in extended foster care, um, and also CSEC clients. Um, and CSEC stands for Commercial Sexual Exploitation of Children. Um, and so our team consists of one attorney, which is Cave, and two case managers, myself um, and Sarah. And we work closely with our parenting clients or expecting parenting clients um, to address the risk factors in which they were referred to us. Um, and just a little bit about kind of how this has been for us is just, I, I'm a lived experience person. So I have experience in the foster care system and I'm also a mom. And our other case manager, Sarah, is also a mom. And so I, it's really been helpful um, in our work, because as we work to support our young parents and families, um, a lot of kind of our expertise is, is pulled from our own lived experiences as, as mothers and then myself as a former foster youth. The framework that we use to build our program that Ebony was introducing um, is one of reproductive justice. And I know we already heard about it together today from Dr. Bridges this morning. So I'm not going to belabor it, um, but just in case, as the incredible activist Loretta, Loretta Ross defines it, reproductive justice, the term initially arose out of Black, Brown, and Indigenous feminist collectives for whom it was crucial to fight equally for these three things. Number one, the right to have a child. Number two, the right not to have a child. And number three, the right to parent the children we have, as well as to control our birth options. But rather than hear it from me, we wanted to give a moment, um, just a quick one, for Loretta Ross to explain it um, herself. If by some miracle this technology works, we will see. When it comes to reproductive justice, if you start with the pregnancy, you're starting at the wrong place. 
You have to start with what's going on in the person's life before they're pregnant. My name is Loretta Ross, and I'm a reproductive justice and human rights activist. I was one of 12 black women who helped create the term reproductive justice when we spliced together reproductive rights and social justice because there were social justice issues prevalent in a pregnant person's life long before they even knew they were pregnant. Because if they had housing insecurity or fear of losing their jobs or fear of violence in their lives, that would determine whether they would keep an unplanned pregnancy or not. Now in short, reproductive justice has three basic principles. Every human being has the right to not have a child and use birth control or abortion or abstinence if that works for them. And we have to fight for the right to have the children that we want to have, and that's the second tenet. And it spawned a whole movement called birth justice, which is to control the conditions under which we have children. And then the third tenet is once the baby is born, we fight for the right to raise our children in safe and healthy environments. Now, 10 years after 1994, the LGBT movement added a fourth principle about bodily autonomy, gender identity, and sexual pleasure. I'm not surprised that reproductive justice emerged out of black women's reproductive experiences because when we were kidnapped from Africa and bought here to breed as a wealth building strategy for capitalism, then our children were prized. But that same womb product became problematized and criminalized after slavery. I'm really invested in people seeing their entire world through the human rights framework, because it doesn't matter what economic or social system you live under, because if it protects your human rights, that's the system you need to work to build. If it violates your human rights, that's the system you work to deconstruct. So that framework um, that Loretta Ross described really was at the heart of how we thought about building our program. I and mean, we're going to flesh out throughout this presentation how it continues to inform our work. <clears throat> I love that video. <laughs> um, so yes, we do take a reproductive justice approach. Um, and I think why we do this is because it's what's right. Um, it's what's just. Um, and access to justice for everyone, I think, is the goal here, especially when we're working with like a vulnerable population, um, like our young adults and our young parenting folks in the foster care system. Um, we all know or are aware of the disproportionality and the um, disparate outcomes for families of colors in child welfare systems, um, and that their access to justice issues extend to other areas of civil legal aid that might also impact our clients too. Um, and we can talk about this um, a little bit more in depth when we kind of explain um, our practice. Um, I think another part of our approach is the trauma-informed advocacy. I think it's really important to know the population that we're serving. We are working with current and former foster youth um, that have most likely experienced um, some trauma um, navigating the child welfare system as minors um, and are now young adults um, preparing to have a family of their own. And so um, still navigating the foster care system in an extended version. And so it's really important that as service providers, we understand um, that our clients have experienced some type of trauma and are still you know, working to um, process that trauma. Um, and we want to make sure that we can help with that um, so that it doesn't kind of become intergenerational trauma. Um, and so our approach kind of consists of um, our multidisciplinary um, team. And we hope that in working together, we limit the number of agencies and service providers that our clients are gonna come into contact with and have to like retell their stories and become re-triggered and um, hopefully limit the need to repeat or disclose the trauma that they've experienced in their life. So this is a graphic developed by uh, Casey Family Programs. Um, and we found it a nice way to consider where exactly the majority of our work lives. 
So for Ebony and I, our work primarily resides in the middle to latter end of this spectrum. We provide pre-petition representation and engage in preventive legal advocacy to hopefully reduce the odds of a petition being filed on our families. Um, but then if a petition is unfortunately filed against one of our parents, we provide post-petition representation to help them fight um, to reunify with their children and keep their children in their care if that's what they want to do. But basically, Ebony and I um, work with our pregnant and parenting clients, who again, are all youth in the foster care system, before a petition is filed against them as parents to provide holistic representation and hopefully ward off any child welfare investigation. And we just wanna quickly highlight here exactly why that kind of early advocacy is so essential for our families. I'm not gonna go through all these, but we did want to foreground this first piece on trauma and Ebony touched on this earlier already. This is I think in part an obvious thing. If we can help children from being removed from their families in the first place, then that's an immense trauma for both child and parent that can be avoided. But perhaps the less obvious thing is that the traumas engendered by any child welfare investigation on our clients, even if that investigation doesn't result in the filing of a petition or children being removed, that experience of going through the investigation itself of being interviewed by social workers, um, being asked to drug test, uh, having your children um, physically examined, questioned, everything that goes along with that. That's really, really scary for any parent, um, let alone our clients who are all by definition intimately familiar with the child welfare system already. So, a chief goal for our work is trying to defend our clients and protect them, not just from family separation, but also the trauma of those investigations. So with that kind of overarching goal in mind, um, we wanted to take a step back to share a bit more about the specific context in which our program took shape. So as we can see here, of all babies born in California, 10% are reported to Child Protective Services by the time they turn three. But for our clients, and those tend to be um, mothers or birthing folks who are in foster care at the time they give birth, that rate jumps to 53%. 53% of the children born to mothers who are in foster care will be reported to Child Protective Services by the time they turn three. And that number, which is already pretty staggeringly high, climbs to 68% for young mothers in foster care with histories of unstable placement and mental health needs. 68%, right? And the point of those numbers is both for us to engage with them and kind of show where exactly our work came from, but also to note, we share these numbers with our clients. And we do that in a sensitive trauma-informed way, not just a, you know, hey, did you know? Um, but we do wanna make absolutely sure that when we talk about heightened scrutiny, when we talk about the over surveillance to which our clients are exposed, we want them to know exactly what that means and what the consequences can be. These next numbers are of course, LA County and California specific, but um, first of all, that's the context in which our work took shape. And second of all, we know Los Angeles County is the largest foster care system in the country. So it's a particularly good indicator of what things look like. Um, and looking at these LA County numbers, we see, um, we know that when we're talking about our youth in care, we know that certain disproportionalities are already baked in. So we see here black youth, Latino, Latina, Latinx youth, um, LGBTQ youth, all overrepresented in foster care systems. 
And we know, right, that this is not an accidental overrepresentation, but rather the results of specific historical lineages. Yeah. <clears throat> I know when I first heard those numbers, I was so taken back. Um, I, as a foster youth who kind of made it out the system, um, I, it was obvious to me just based on like, you know, my journey and experience and the people that I've encountered, but I think to hear the numbers, um, it was just mind blowing. So this is why, um, we designed the program, um, because we, you know, it, to me, it would seem like there are specific youth, um, or types of young adults that are being targeted here um, with the over surveillance, right? And the lack of support from these like structural institutions that um, Dr. Bridges was talking about. Um, so, but a, a part, like a key component of our pre-filing um, initiative project is the multi-generational foster care involvement. So it, it's our goal to break the cycles. Um, we want to help our young, parenting clients in foster care kind of disrupt this cycle of child welfare involvement. And how we do that is we support them in a various of different ways. Um, and we really, like Kabe said, defend them if they do find themselves navigating an investigation with the child welfare system, um, a petition, um, and hopefully not. But if they do come to a point where they are looking at getting their children detained or removed from them and kind of experiencing some family separation, um, then we would kind of defend them po post filing. Um, and so it's been a journey um, and I feel like I've learned so much um, just about the systems I think in our society, but more so the resilience I think in our clients that we serve. Um, I'm so honored to kind of work with some of um, all of our clients. Um, they, each situation um, in each of our clients' lives are so different, um, but I, I really do feel honored to like be beside them and um, provide this type of support and assistance. Um, because it's it just it's the right thing to do. Um, so just to kind of get into the multi-generational foster care involvement, um, we know that our young parents in the system, they carry trauma and fear of future system involvement with their children, um, but oftentimes don't know how to prevent that, right? A lot of our times our clients, sorry about my birds, a lot of our times our clients um, are unaware that they're at risk of kind of getting involved with the child welfare system. A lot of those risks look like um, mental health, um, um, substance use, domestic violence, um, sometimes unstable housing, um, poverty. Like, so I think one of the things that was really eye-opening to me is, is kind of just having those conversations with our clients and making them aware. Um, about the risks in their lives. Um, and it was pretty clear to me um, that a lot of our clients are surviving. And when you're in survival mode, it's really hard to understand that, you know, there are current risks in your life. So if somebody is in a domestic violence relationship or situation or experiencing intimate partner violence, like it is really likely that they are unaware that that is even happening to them because they're either in survival mode or these are the type of relationships that were modeled to them when they were growing up. And so it's it's hard for our clients to identify that as a risk. Um, and so a lot of our conversations kind of, you know, look like educating our clients on those on the risk factors and how that's going to impact them and their children and how it might lead to system involvement um, and how to prevent it. And a lot of other times it's referring them to programs and um, other resources that might help explain and educate as well. Um, and so working with our clients, I want to say unanimously, none of them want, um, you know, their children to become involved in the system. None of our clients want their children uh, to lose their children to the system or be separated from their children, um, which has been honestly a beautiful thing to see um, 
Like I can talk about the resilience of our young parents all day. Um, but it's been, um, it's just been really inspiring to see our parents fight so hard um, for their reproductive rights um, from beginning to end. And so I think what we do is really important because we create like a safety net for our clients, one to feel safe, even talking to social workers and investigators or any child welfare person um, and making empowering them to be aware of their rights when navigating these types of situations um, because they already have like the fight in them, but you know, they may need to know a little bit about the systems in which they're supposed to trust. It's kind of like what Dr. Bridge was saying earlier. Um, I wrote it down here. Inst these structural institutions, they want the buy-in of clients, but in order to get the buy-in, um, it requires the structural institutions to be trustworthy. And I feel like we see this so much in our clients. Um, if they do find themselves navigating an investigation or a referral, they are really reluctant to talk, um, to open up their homes um, and things like that. And so that is their right. And their history in the foster care system when they were younger is kind of what shapes these type of fears. Um, and so um, this is kind of what we do in our pre-filing program. Um, the case managers like myself and Sarah, we um, are really there side by side with our clients. Um, if they are contacted by anyone in the child welfare system about risks or referral coming in, um, we can be there with them when they talk to um, dependency investigators as they kind of learn more about the situation and gather all the facts. Um, and of course, accompany them to court if it gets there um, and represent them um, if we're looking at an open case. So just to continue that theme, right? Like how did we build our program? Um, and I know client centered advocacy, you know, is such a buzzword, um, but really it's just a way for us of saying that our program began just by getting to know our clients in the way that Ebony was describing. Now, I'm not going to read this whole thing, but I do just want to highlight these last couple sentences. When an advocacy organization works to advance the rights of marginalized individuals, how do the lawyers ensure that the advancements sought? are what those individuals want and that the process reflects their worldview. When a legal services organization providing representation for indigent families decides to expand their services, how do the lawyers determine what would really be helpful to their clients and their children? This articulation has been so key for us because it names exactly the space that we were in. We were a legal services organization dedicated to providing representation for youth in foster care, and we were trying to expand into pre-petition representation to better serve our pregnant and parenting folks in care. So to build our program, we basically talked with our clients. And the specifics of our situation allowed us to do that in productive ways. Our team then was just me and Ebony. Um, we've since added an incredible second case manager, Sarah Flores. And we had a relatively small caseload. So we had time to drive around Los Angeles, sit down with our clients at length. Um, and this is, you know, when we were building this program, this is the height of COVID. So usually we're at a park, somewhere outside, somewhere near their home. And just sit down with them and ask them, what do you need? What do you want? What would help? What wouldn't help? Um, we had a pre-existing mandate to provide representation to those clients. So it was easier to ask, how can we better represent your interests on the parenting side of things? And that's really how we built our program, through those conversations. As far as the nuts and bolts of how we get clients, our clients are referred to us by their CLC attorneys or case managers. Um, and our referral form asks the ref whoever's making the referral to articulate some sort of risk, right? What makes this particular client at particular risk of child welfare intervention? And the unfortunate thing is that for our clients, as the statistics at the top show, our clients are statistically more likely than not 
to be reported to Child Protective Services before their child turns three. So foster care status in and of itself is a really salient risk factor. Um, and we can talk more about why that is and how that plays out in the Q&A if folks are interested. But because at this point, we don't have capacity to take on every one of our clients, we do try to prioritize those who are most at risk for agency scrutiny and intervention. Um, so like Ebony said, situations in which there's known substance use or domestic violence or CSEC risks um, and so on. And then we'll talk to the client about our program, tell them what we do, see if they're interested um, and emphasize that it's voluntary. They definitely do not have to be interested. Um, and then if they do come on board, we'll continually uh, meet with their dependency attorney and just keep those conversations going to make sure that we're collaborating with our client's village throughout. So we're not, we don't have time today to fully outline the range of holistic representation we provide um, once our clients come on board, but suffice it to say for now that our clients have intersecting areas of need um, that we help them address in a variety of legal and non-legal ways. And one of those areas we always address with clients is reproductive health, which Ebony will talk more about. Yes, so I think, like Kaveh said, when we're getting to know our clients and really shaping our practice um, by asking those really important questions, like, what is it that you need? How can we help? Um, it, 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 it shaped our reproductive um, justice framework, I would say. And I quickly learned supporting young parenting clients that um, in order to service them, we, we needed that holistic approach. We needed to make sure that they were taking care of um, themselves um, as individuals and then as parenting um, youth um, if we wanted to set them up for success. And so we had to really look into the areas of need and for our clients, a lot of our clients, it was around reproductive health. And so um, CLC partnered with like a really good resource, um, Essential uh, Access Health. And there, a lot of us as case managers, peer advocates, um, and investigators received uh, a training, two types of training, and I think they're going to be extending more. One was a family planning health worker certification training, and the other was a pregnancy options um, counseling certification training. Um, next slide, Kave, just so I could dive into. So two of these, I've, I've taken two of these trainings, and what they've done is really equipped us as service providers on how to have those kind of challenging and difficult uh, conversations about, you know, the birds and the bees <laughs> and just healthy relationships, um, pregnancy, prenatal care, postnatal care, perinatal care, um, really teaching our clients how to take care of themselves in order to take care of their families. And so both of these certification courses, um, I think have been really instrumental in, you know, working to support our clients around their reproductive health. Um, and I kind of outlined a couple of bullet points here, just in terms of what we were able to gain um, and the outcomes of each of these certification um, courses. Um, so with the family planning health worker certification course, um, we learned a lot about, um, you know, constructing a reproductive life plan, um, which we've kind of put into practice um, it as constructing a birth plan. That's something that we and Sarah, the other case manager, really um, work with our clients on once they become pregnant. Um, and we have to remember, like a lot of our clients, I would say, and statistics can, can show as well that a lot of foster youth and former foster youth's pregnancies um, were unplanned. And so it doesn't, what we like to tell our clients is, you know, uh, just because the pregnancy was unplanned doesn't mean um, we cannot create a plan, right, moving forward. So a plan for birth, a plan for your family. Um, and that kind of looks like beyond birth. Do you want to have any more kids? Um, you know, what does that look like if yes or no? Um, and so the family planning health worker certification course really gave us the tools um, and skills to kind of have those conversation and help clients access um, what they needed um, in terms of information and, um, you know, health um, 
overall family planning resources and things like that. The pregnancy counseling option certification was really cool too, because while the family planning health worker certification kind of helps us service our clients as a, a family and helps them plan, you know, for their future family um, and what that looks like. The pregnancy counseling option, um, I feel really gave me the skill set to have those conversations um, in a really, you know, important and vital stage, um, which is before pregnancy, during pregnancy, and after pregnancy. So there we kind of, um, uh, for a lot of us, it, it was like the first bullet says, like assessing our personal opinions and beliefs concerning pregnancy options and decisions. I think it was really eye-opening because we have to remember that even though we all have our um, beliefs and um, around pregnancy and um, abortion, we are here for the clients. And the focus is really on the right to choice, no matter, you know, what that may be for them. And so I thought it was really moving that that particular uh, course. Um, and it also just really helped us uh, learn how to have the conversations about options, right? We want to always empower our clients to know and become aware that they have options in life, right? Whether that's before pregnancy, um, to become pregnant, to parent or not. Um, and so it was really interesting to learn about all the different options and avenues for our clients. And um, I think that I have seen firsthand how having those conversations have been really, really helpful, um, especially for our clients in foster care, our minor mothers in particular. Um, and so from these certification courses, kind of how we put it into practice is we have these um, repro health talks or chats with our clients. It's where other attorneys in our firm can refer their clients um, that um, are minors in the system. Um, they don't have to be pregnant. They can just be teens um, because we want to start thinking about whether or not foster youth in general are getting access to the resources around reproductive health or even having those conversations. Um, and so um, we developed a referral process where attorneys can refer their clients to any of the family planning um, health workers um, that are certified like myself. And what we will do is we will sit down with our clients and have these conversations um, around everything reproductive health. Um, so that's um, birth control, contraceptive types and methods, STDs, healthy relationships and consent. Um, and it looks different for every client depending on what stage they're at. And again, we could even do this for our um, pregnant and expecting clients um, around family planning, um, you know, walking them through the importance of prenatal care, um, postnatal care, the perinatal care, maternal mental health, and things like that. Um, and a lot of times what this looks like in real practice is um, after these conversations, helping them, you know, schedule an appointment to talk to um, a healthcare provider about birth control, right? Um, if that's what they choose. Um, going to the appointments with them. My favorite thing is going to our uh, clients' uh, prenatal cares or like the two-week postpartum care where there's like a new baby. And like, I, I know that I've heard firsthand from our clients how helpful that is. I think in theory, you would go with, you know, your partner, but for a lot of our clients, um, they don't necessarily have a partner there with them. Um, a lot of our clients don't necessarily have, you know, a family member, like a mom or a sister to accompany them to those, um, appointments. And it's scary. You have this whole new life with you and a ton of questions and, you know, you're healing physically and mentally and kind of just processing this new life. And so it's, it's really awesome to be there for them and support them and encourage them to have conversations with the healthcare providers. Um, there, you know, they talk about milestones and the baby's development and, um, you know, tips and hacks and things like that. I think one of the most interesting um, experiences that I've had accompanying a client to um, an appointment was um, one of our clients had 
real reservations about vaccinating her children, um, which I think we all do. I can remember when, you know, I went to the two week appointment and your, your brand new baby <laughs> is receiving its vaccinations and you're like scared and you have all these questions. And I know that I can remember feeling like, can I ask this question? Like, I don't want the doctor to feel that I'm being, you know, non-compliant and that I, you know, by doing this, am I, am I harming my child? Am I not? And so it was so awesome to like facilitate that conversation between the doctor and our client. And it was just this beautiful dialogue of vaccination. And I have to shout out that doctor for being so patient and understanding with this young parent, because a lot of our times our clients do not get that grace. Um, you know, they're these young parents that are already, you know, stereotyped and stigmatized, um, and they don't feel empowered to have conversations with their doctor. Um, and so it was awesome to witness that. And I have to say, I do feel like a lot of that happened because I was there to support her and facilitate that conversation. Um, so that was really awesome. Nice. Um, and so two terms that I think I've learned through courses and certification programs is maternal mental health and perinatal health. And so um, I just kind of wanted to share these with everyone. So the perinatal is the period of time when you become pregnant um, and up to a year after giving birth. So it's it's right when you become pregnant and then, you know, right after. And so it usually begins at the 20th and the 28th week of gestation, and then at the 20th to the 28th week of gestation and ends one to four weeks after delivery. So, and, you know, we can put it into a, you know, um, time frame, but the thing to remember is like right before <laughs> pregnancy or at the beginning of pregnancy and then right after. And I think this is such an important period because this is where one, um, the body will take on lots of changes, um, both physically and mentally. And our clients may need a lot of support as they go through that. And then right after, of course, as you just, you know, welcome new life into this world, obviously that can be overwhelming and scary and, you know, a ton of other things. And so really, really important to pay attention and support our clients during those stages. Um, and then just maternal health, um, refers to the health of, um, women during, during pregnancy, childbirth and the postpartum period. And unfortunately I will say, I feel like all of these periods are, um, not really prioritized when we, in the child welfare system. I can remember cases, um, that I've worked on where we had a client that just gave birth and like they're expected. And this is pre COVID days, they were expected right into court, you know, a week after having a baby. And I just feel like one that's inconsiderate <laughs> and two, um, like it's, it's dismissing the importance of that person's maternal health. Um, right. Um, the right to just bond with the child. We see that disrupted when we have our clients that experience getting their children removed to them right after birth. So there's, the child welfare system sometimes does cause a disruption um, to you know, our clients' maternal health in so many different ways that I've witnessed firsthand. And so really want to stress the importance of maternal health and perinatal health with our expecting and parenting clients. And so to return now to our initial reproductive justice framework, um, once someone decides to parent, how can we provide them with the resources necessary to ensure that they're able to parent with the dignity that every family deserves? In California, we have specific parent support services, um, which have been written into code for our clients. And so one of the things we always do with our clients is to ensure that they are able to assert their rights to access those services. Um, and one, I'm not going to go through all of these, but one of those services is something called uh, an EPI conference. Um, and Ebony's going to outline what that looks like now. Yes. Um, so our EPY conferences are for our expecting and parenting um, clients um, that are in the system. So DCFS, uh, the Department of Children and Family Services actually hosts these. Um, and so this is a specialized conference. It's client centered. So our clients can choose who they want there. Um, that can be their partner, their family, anyone involved in their village. 
Um, and so these client-centered conferences are designed to um, really identify and address the needs of the client um, now that they are pregnant or parenting. Um, and they also really bring up a lot of different um, resources that are available to the client. So it's just, think of it as a round table of resourceful people um, pointing our clients in the right direction to get uh, access the resources um, that they will need as they begin, you know, their parenting journey. And these conferences are totally voluntary. Um, and like I said, um, client centered. Um, so lots of benefits about, uh, you know, with having an EPY conference, one family planning aspect, right? Um, just creating a space to have those conversations where our clients can talk about what they envision, you know, for their family, the plan that they'd like for their family. Um, they talk about um, placement stability and support for, you know, our young parents and the child. Um, a lot of times, uh, you know, there's issues with housing, right? And mom may not have anywhere to live. The family may not have anywhere to live. So these are those places where you can talk about that. Um, and we would connect the client to just the resources that are available to them, housing programs that are available to them. Um, uh, here we, you know, connect them to prenatal care, um, talk out a birth plan, creating a birth plan, and just um, engaging them with uh, the maternal and paternal family networks. Um, just assessing overall, what is it that they need? How can we help them to get there? Um, here we would talk out if there is any family law issues, um, including establishing paternity, things that um, our clients may struggle otherwise to kind of figure out themselves. Here are a round table of folks that can help you or at least refer you to the people that you know will. Um, and lastly, um, I think a huge benefit of the EPY conferences are um, the, that they collaborate with lots of uh, community resources like um, the public health nurse, um, the nurse family partner, wraparound services, the Department of Public and uh, Social Services, um, Department of Mental Health, therapy, CASAs, um, resource specialists, um, all things that are going to help support our client and their family to thrive. As for some other specific resources that we help our parenting clients access, um, I'm just gonna quickly go through these. So a whole family foster home um, is a placement option designed specifically for parenting youth and their children. And it's meant to assist youth in developing the necessary skills to provide a safe, stable, and permanent home for their child. Infant Supplement is a $900 per month um, amount that's paid to caregivers or youth directly, um, and it includes that that includes the expectant parent payment, um, which is additional money that's dispersed in the three months, the last three months of pregnancy, to help prepare for the baby's arrival. Parenting support plan um, is for youth who are in a SILP, a supervised independent living placement, um, and that gives youth an extra $200 per month if they enter into a plan with, with a trusted adult. Um, and lastly, the emergency child care bridge funding. This is basically the recognition that child care is a foundational issue for parents generally. Um, and it's comprised of an emergency voucher um, while more stable, sustainable child care is sorted out in addition to a navigator to help establish child care and identify options. And just to make the obvious point, right, these all clearly relate again to our initial reproductive justice framework as they provide some, not all, but some of the necessary resources to allow folks to parent in the fashion that they desire. Before opening it up to Q&A, um, and I know we have, I saw we have a couple questions in the chat already, so we'll address those. And then if any others, um, feel free to put them in the chat, or we can just, I'm going to stop screen share and we can just kind of talk together. Um, but before we open it up, with Dr. Bridges' distinction between the law and the books and the law on the ground in mind, 
we wanted to quickly highlight some of the law on the books um, and that's been recently proposed in California specifically. So we don't have time now to delve into the details of all of these, um, but we offer them as a closing because as Dr. Bridges and Cody and Madonna uh, reminded us this morning, even when we have great reproductive justice legislation like these examples, the task remains for advocates to give them teeth and to actually enforce them uh, with and for our clients. And so if there are specific questions about any of these, we can talk more about AB 670, AB 366, or the proposed AB 656. Um, but for now, I'll just leave them on the screen. This is our contact info. Please, please, please don't hesitate to get in touch um, whenever questions about, more questions about our program, about what developing something like this in your jurisdiction would look like. Uh, we'd be happy to get in touch and talk anything out. So I will stop sharing my screen. Great. And just to delve into the chat. So I think that there was an initial question from someone about nurse family partner. Mm -hmm. From Elizabeth said, how oh, have you heard of nurse family partnership? Would we be able to refer to your services if needed? So we have heard of nurse family partnership. We love nurse family partnership. Um, I think Dr. Bridges touched on it just in terms of she said something here that I wrote down. Um, so she said something in terms of the child welfare system, instead of removing children, right, we should work to improve the structural um, institutions to support our young families. Um, and so I think of the community resources like Nurse Family Partnership, and for everyone who doesn't know what that program is, it is um, an agency of uh, nurses that if you refer your pregnant or parenting client there, they can come alongside our client, offer them support through their um, pregnancy and stay with them up until their child turns two. So this is a nurse like at their disposal. Um, I, I know when my son was born, you freak out about every little thing, right? Like why is he making that noise or is he eating enough? And so I would have loved to have a nurse <laughs> that I can call text or just come visit me to check in on me. Um, my sister actually utilized this service. Um, she was a young um, parent um, fresh out of high school. And um, that nurse was like just a savior. She was so awesome and supportive and help my sister understand all the different nuances of parenting and motherhood. And um, we were so grateful for her. And so we definitely refer our clients to nurse family partnership before, um, I mean, as soon as we hear that they're pregnant um, and a lot of them are usually open to that type of support. And, and, and just to, just really quick, I mean, just to add on to that a tiny bit, like I think nurse family partnership is such a great example of the kind of resource linkage that can make such a difference um, in the lives of our families. And so often, I mean, like Ebony's describing, any new parent, you know, you just, you don't know when things are happening with your with your new baby, you know, and they seem so vulnerable. And I think there's an anxiety that's inherent to being a new parent. Um, and so having someone that you can just call up rather than, so we had a client who, was consistently bringing her baby into the emergency room um, repeatedly because she was worried because, you know, he, something he would be acting a little strange, a little fever, like something seemed off. And so she'd rush him to the emergency room. And those repeated trips to the ER actually generated a um, child welfare referral because the hospital started to get concerned about them, right? Because they were like, why is this mom kind of continuing to bring this baby into the emergency room? What's going on here? Um, and a resource like Nurse Family Partner eliminates that issue because it's just someone, you know, in that moment, you can call your own personal nurse to basically bounce those questions off of and see if you, if it's something you really do need to take the baby into the ER or not.
Um, so that helps a lot. Yeah. Um, and I think the second part of her question was, would we be able to refer to your services if needed? So unfortunately, so we are a very specific program for um, our clients in the LA County um, foster care system. And so if you have a client who is a current youth in care um, and who is pregnant or parenting, shoot us an email and we can we can definitely um, talk about what's possible. So just to add on to that real quick, uh, this is Elizabeth, a lot of our um, foster care youth um when it comes to you know other services like like nurse family partnership is very specific like you said for those times when they need a nurse however they're unable to get resources or even find resources for them or figure out the system as far as uh, foster care like housing and how they utilize their 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 money that they get monthly and all of their um, you know, how, how they go about, you know, applying for maybe a, a rented room that they need. And so when they don't have a rented room, then, you know, someone comes across them, like you said, they go into emergency rooms, they see, um, they see a baby, they see a young parent, they report them to DCFS, and here we go. Right. So I think um, if, if your, your program touches on all needs, right? Is that what I'm understanding? And so having the referral to, to you, you can help them when not just specifics like Nurse Family Partnership, which is a great, great program, but um, all around, um, you know, to, to keep them out of that, you know, like you say, that generational um having their they're, they're always fearful of having foster care now for their babies since they are in foster care themselves yeah for sure i would say that one thing that has helped is we have we do have to understand that the nurse family partner um is going to work within their scope of things they are there to support our clients um you know, with all things nurse and medical and stuff, um, that's something that I wouldn't be able to do. You know, you call me about your child's fever. I'm going to ask the basic questions and a nurse can really, you know, ask beyond and help them really uh, get through that. But one, you made a good point, Elizabeth, in that they don't know about infant supplements. They don't know about DCFS um, and helping a, a former foster youth. And so I would say to that, that's where collaboration, I think, would come in, um, inviting the nurse family partner, you know, onto the, the team of support for this client um, and having conversations. I know I've been able to form really good connections with nurse family partner um, nurses when we're helping a client together. And so, you know, they'll help educate me on how to support the client that way. And I can help educate them on, you know, what it's like to navigate uh, the foster care system as a non-minor dependent or as a minor, right? What they're eligible for. Um, and so we just kind of put our heads together and um, come up with all things that will help support our client um, to become stable. Um, so I think collaboration is the key, um, inviting nurse family partners and other community partners to the conversation when it comes to supporting the client. And yes, just that, and they, oh, you go ahead. They're able to um, also participate in the, I think that it's called EPY meetings, right? And and I, I love those meetings because um, they're able, we're able to get the whole aspect of everybody who's involved. And sometimes it's so overwhelming, even for the people helping them, giving them the services, as much as it is for, for the for the for the youth to navigate each person and what they do and where to go to when they need certain help it's just so confusing for a lot of them and that i i know i just i am glad you you have something in place where um they can you know go to one a one-stop thing and say hey this is a person you need to talk to this is a person you need to talk to these are your rights this is this so um thank you so much no, it's, it's such a great point. Um, we, we found with so many of our clients, you know, they have big support teams, right? A lot of people involved in their case. 
And one thing that we try to do is just streamline communication because it can get so, you know, if you have 20 different people all kind of working on different things, sometimes it's confusing, not just for the client, but for everyone. So trying to get folks together, like Ebony said, put our heads together, that's kind of foundational to what we can do. Um, there's a question from Karina about, are you, are you located in San Diego? So again, so unfortunately, we're just in um, Los Angeles County, um, but I really do, I mean, I just encourage folks to think about in your different places, your different jurisdictions, how you could develop some type of prevention, early defense program. Um, we had a small team. We are still a small team. Um, and we kind of just, you know, we built it from, from the ground up. Um, and we can talk more about what that looked like. If folks are interested, please email whenever. I'm always, we're always happy to discuss that. But we are not personally in San Diego. Um, and that relates, there's a question from Joanne about the name of our program. So this, so we're the pre-filing initiative with Children's Law Center of California. Um, and then any other questions? There's one from Tamara. Are the resources mentioned available to counties outside the ones you serve? So I'm not really sure. I know that they're LA County, but some of them may extend outside of LA County. If not, there there are probably other um, programs that are very similar. Like I know I've come across a lot of programs similar to the Nurse Family Partner called something else, um, but it's you know they they share the the commonality that it's someone coming alongside this client to support them in this type of way as they you know embark on parenting. Um, and I just wanted to really take it back to Elizabeth's um, comment that she shared, you know, it is, it, this is a complex system, I think. And when we think of young adults just trying to live their life, um, who are then becoming parents and then trying to um, navigate parenting and a family, um, they need a lot of help. You know, a big part of our um, strategy is helping them understand that it takes a village. Almost every parent has a village, right? And a lot of the times for our clients, the natural supports, meaning family, mom, dad, like they may not have that um, coming out of the child welfare system. Um, and so a lot of it is just helping them build a village um, with different types of support. So I know Kave, Sarah, and I, we're a part of a lot of our clients' village. Um, even if it's for, you know, a certain amount of time, because we do only work with our clients up till they're 21, you know, um, we're there for them up until that time. And then, you know, I know that I am just like always forming relationships with our clients that'll probably go past that. And so we just always want to encourage our client, like this is going to be um, challenging for so many different reasons. And what can help is if you have the support in place. Um, and this is how you look for that support, introducing them to these people, right? That can help in these different areas and just utilizing everyone to the best of their ability. Yeah. Um, and, and just briefly to, to Tamara's question about resources, you know, that is where that California legislation that we quickly highlighted at the end um, has been so crucial. So things like the expectant parent payment um, which gives $900 per month for the last three months of pregnancy. That was um, LA County specific, um, and it was a little different um, in LA County, but we had some program like that, and now it's statewide. And so things like that have kind of been expanded, and obviously that's still California specific, um, but that's an example of a resource that's available to folks outside throughout California. Um, and some of the others are as well, like everything that's written into code about the kinds of parenting support systems available to youth and care, that's all statewide as well, even if the specific programs are going to vary. If there are no more questions, I think we're at time. Thank you so much to everyone for coming out and have a great rest of the conference.